we're here this morning with Ms. Z's fifth grade class in, in Radford City Schools. Um, and we're also here with Isaac and Melissa uh, with wildlife, uh, wildlife Habitat Fragmentation and You. Those are some big old words, but I know they're going to teach them to us. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa and Isaac. Isaac and I are both from the Interfaces of Global Change graduate student organization at um, Virginia Tech. And that is a program at Virginia Tech um, that consists of many different departments um, work with people working towards um, global change, which can be anything from conservation to um, that involves an interdisciplinary group of people. So that means people that do a bunch of different jobs. And I'm Melissa Burt and I'm a graduate student in the biology department at Virginia Tech. Um, and I study how uh, habitat fragmentation, which we're going to be going over in a few minutes, um, affects ants and how they interact with plants. How's everybody doing? Uh, so I'm Isaac Van Deest. I'm also a biology student at Virginia Tech. Uh, and I look at how cities change what is available for birds to eat and how that affects them and their babies. Today, the first thing that we're going to do is go over um, what habitat fragmentation even is and how it affects organisms. And then we are going to talk about habitat corridors and how and why land managers use them. What do plants and animals need to live? I see food and water. Yep, those are two of the, the core things. Yeah, mm -hmm. sunlight, that's a really good one because sunlight, if you don't have sunlight, there, there's a few places that work, like you can live without sunlight, but that's like if you're at the bottom of the ocean and you're really specialized, but yeah, almost everything needs sunlight for the, the plants to grow for the food, right? Shelter, that's good. Carbon dioxide. So on this next slide, we have some pictures of, of all of those things. Plants and animals need water and food and sunlight and clean air um, and um, in order to survive. And so they need habitats like shelter or space that's gonna give them that. When we're thinking about what habitat fragmentation is, we can first think about what it's not. Um, and on the left side of this slide here, you can see a cartoon image of what an intact habitat would look like. So that's right here. Um, and in that picture, you can see that there's um, this interior space where animals live. And then there's this edge that different animals live in. And on the right side, we can see what happens after fragmentation occurs, which is when we break habitat into smaller pieces. This usually occurs as the result of human activities. Um, in this picture itself, we could see that this road here is breaking that once in intact piece of habitat into two separate pieces. This can also happen from other things too, um, like um, farming and deforestation and housing development, development or industry. Um, so basically all of those things when humans are using up habitat, such as with this road here, we can see that we're taking away habitat from the animals that live there. And then um, we're also breaking up the habitat into these smaller pieces. The first thing that you might notice about the picture on the right here is that by making a road, we take away that habitat space from the wildlife that lives there. Um, the road is decreasing habitat for the wildlife in the in, in, mostly in this interior part of the habitat. If we compare the interior habitat in the picture of intact habitat with the picture after fragmentation, we can see that there are less species in the fragmented habitat. Uh, so in this interior space, we have three different kinds of species as shown by these animal tracks. Um, and then if we look over here after fragmentation, we lose this species here, the one with the, um, it looks to be like some kind of maybe some kind of cat or feline animal. Um, so we lose that from this. So we have less species overall in these interior habitat spaces, but um, 
we and basically are left with those that are in the ex, the edgy part of the habitat. Um, second, by creating this road, we are making a barrier that prevents movement of species from one side of the road to another. And so an animal might still be able to cross the road, but now we have this additional risk of cars coming down the road. Overall, we can see that we're changing the amount of habitat available. So if we looked at just this darker green area, um, the interior part of the habitat, we see that there's a lot less space here um, that's darker green in the fragmented area. Now that we know how fragmentation can potentially affect wildlife, I thought I'd show a real life example of what habitat fragmentation um, looks like near you in Radford. This is a map of Radford and the surrounding area. Uh, there are two boxes, one yellow and one red, um, that are around one area that's very fragmented versus an area that is pretty intact. The yellow is the fragment. It's got all the, the roads and looks like housing and maybe businesses, but whereas the red has a little bit of fragmenting, but mostly is, is forest, right? It's not that there's no habitat. We can see these small sections of habitat that just like in the last picture where they're separated, um, the, this, these smaller sections are separated from each other. And so it might be hard for an animal to move from this side of the box to the other side. All right, so we've talked a lot about fragmentation and, and, and whatnot. So here, we've got a couple different habitats, right? You've got habitat A and habitat B. And to really simplify it, I want you guys to think about like, these are two different rooms in your house, right? And they're not, but they're not connected. So how do you get to them? Um, well, you know, in this example, you might just use a hallway and that's what essentially people do on the landscape as well. So they put in corridors. Um, they're not always the most, um, literal places for, for animals to walk, but it, it can be like putting in more green space so they can go from A to B. But the idea behind corridors isn't necessarily to create more habitat. So you're not making more homes or more rooms for the animals, but you are making it much safer for them to move between them. And so if, you know, an animal in habitat A, you know, if they start to run out of food and they need to get to B without a corridor, you know, without the deer signs, it might be dangerous for them to get across that road. But if you do, um, you know, certain things like put tunnels or overpasses or, or you know, don't put a road in there in the first place, then it, they can use that as a corridor to get from the habitat that doesn't have the food to the one that does or back, you know. Uh, so if you want to go to the next slide. So an example of that, of how it would work is on our cartoon from before. So these, um, the hot pink lines are, are like imaginary corridors. So we haven't changed the size of the habitat at all, right? So they're still broken um, in, the, in the two halves, but you are now able, if you're like the little deer or the raccoon or, or the, the turkey, you're able to move between the two. Um, and so let's imagine that these are underpasses. Um, so they go under the highway. And so these animals can now just walk under them. And so it's, it's not as easy, you know, as if there was no road there in the first place, but it's definitely much more, it's much safer for them to move around. So an example of that, um, of, of kind of, of corridors, one is a very small one. So this is, um, like a land bridge. This is in, in Montana, but essentially they have and this is much more expensive than a, in an underpass, but it's it's pretty cool where they have like a bridge that the animals can walk across um, and they have fences around it too. So it funnels all the animals to the, the bridge and then they can walk across the highway. So it's much safer, you know, people don't hit the deer and the deer don't get hit, so everybody wins. So to, to cap off today, um, just wanna reiterate that we talked about uh, kind of habitat loss and that it's, um, Sorry, the destruction does not just result in loss of habitat, it also creates fragmentation. Um, and that habitat corridors are a really good way to um, fix fragmentation to, to a point. Um, and that you have lots of groups who are really trying to do this um, and are actively working together to try and fix these you know, problems that are pretty complicated. Not one group of people can, can fix it on their own. 
I have a question for both of you. Uh, we just have a minute or so. Um, how did you get into studying wildlife corridors? Um, so I, right after I finished um, school at the University of North Carolina, I worked for a group as a field technician um, where we have experimental corridors where we're trying to figure out how um, corridors actually work in a system and what species they work for and um, what kinds of species they don't work for. Um, and so that has set me on the path to doing research on that. Um, and I still actually, that was like um, 10 years ago and I still work with that group today. What's your guys' favorite part about wildlife corridors? I think it's how, how they work so well and everyone kind of gets on board because like other other ideas that help wildlife are like oh you know don't build this here or like go put in spend a lot of money spend a ton of money on on purchasing land to make it safe for animals and all this stuff and while those things are really great and we should do them when we can in my opinion it's really expensive and it makes other people upset where like this way it just everyone everyone's happy with it it doesn't cost that much money and it, it does some yeah I think it's just like a really good solution. So I just want to say thank you so much to our uh, Global Interfaces group, uh, Melissa and Isaac, and also to Ms. Z's fifth graders.